From Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American original. For over two decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. We've provided a platform for success for some of the most respected companies in the country. We fueled their growth with a highly educated workforce and a can-do, pro-business attitude. Just ask our trusted business partner, Toyota. Visit Mississippi.org to see what we can do for you. If, for such a small word, it packs a wallop. If I live to 100, if Social Security isn't enough, if my heart gets broken, if she says yes. We believe if should never hold you back. If should be managed with a plan that builds on what you already have. Together, we can create a personal safety net, a launching pad for all those brilliant ifs in the middle of life. You can call on our expertise and get guarantees for the if in life. After all, we're MetLife. Issue 1, Russia Reboots. We've made meaningful progress in demonstrating through deeds and works what a more constructive U.S.-Russian relationship can look like in the 21st century. On Monday in Moscow, President Obama met with Russian President Dmitry Medvedev, the first summit in seven years with the Russians. The goal this time was to build a detente, an openness, or glasnost, the word used by Mikhail Gorbachev, in his 1986 last note with Ronald Reagan. The centerpiece of the current reboot, an agreement that both countries will cut their nuclear warheads by one-third, from 2,200 warheads to 1,600, roughly. But both nations are cautious. Despite of the fact that in several hours we cannot uh, remove the burden of all the problems, uh, we have agreed that we will go forward without stopping. Chief among the, quote, burden of all problems, unquote, is perceived encroachment. Both America and Russia militarily involved in each other's backyard. Obama, like his predecessor George W. Bush, wants an anti-missile defense system in Poland and the Czech Republic, the backyard of Russia. And Dmitry Medvedev, in his predecessor and current Prime Minister Vladimir Putin, has exported Russia's military presence to Latin America, our backyard. With Medvedev, it's a fleet of 1,600 naval officers and three warships conducting exercises off the Venezuelan coast late last year. And earlier this year, Russia also exhibited its interest in using Venezuela and Cuba for bases for strategic bombers. And Russia is now supplying $150 million in military helicopters to Bolivia. And $4 billion, repeat, $4 billion in military hardware to Venezuela. Both Bolivia's Morales and Venezuela's Chavez are tight with Russia and with each other. Question, what advantage does this mutual nuclear warhead agreement give to the U.S., Pat Buchanan? Uh, not much at all, John, and I hope we're not going to cut delivery systems. I'm less worried about warheads. But let me say this. You've got that, what you put up there is the Russians are clearly reacting to what we did in the 1990s. Reagan, of course, called it the evil empire and was being patted on the back in Red Square. We had a tremendous relationship. We've moved NATO into their front porch and into their backyard. We've tried to cut them out of the oil of the Caspian. We're putting missiles in Eastern, Eastern Europe, anti-missile missiles. We've helped dump over governments Ukraine and Georgia and tried to do it in Belarus. They are reacting very hostily to what the United States did in the 1990s and under George W. Bush. I give Barack credit. I think he's been open. He's got an authoritarian he's dealing with in Putin, a tough customer who feels that Russia was really had in the 1990s. So I think, I think Barack is on the right course but I don't take too much, put too much stock in this agreement. Well, Russia is also modernizing its submarine fleet. So maybe the savings that it incurs by getting rid of uh, warehousing the old missiles, this which they have to keep up into some kind of usable state, they save that and they put it right into submarines. You're exactly mm -hmm. right, John, in the sense that this is great news for Russia because they'd have to maintain all these land-based, sea-based missiles. They don't have the money we do. Eleanor. Well, it's also great news for us because there's a lot of loose nukes floating around the uh, old Soviet Union and Russia. 
and uh, that can only uh, pose the danger of getting into the into the wrong hands. And President Obama didn't give away anything. We still have enough, you know, warheads to destroy the the world many times over, and they are expensive to keep up in. Sixteen hundred. They are expensive to keep up in this country too. And last time I checked, our economy wasn't doing uh, so well. But what this agreement mostly gives him is uh, some moral high ground because he's got his eye on trying to keep Iran from going nuclear and it's very difficult to try to persuade other nations not to become nuclear powers when you're si sitting atop the, 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 the huge uh, arsenal. So it gives him some bragging rights uh, going forward towards his goal, however uh, unrealistic it may sound today, towards a nuclear free world. You think that Obama changed Russia's thinking uh, Medvedev's thinking about NATO expansion? Not one iota. The problem with this is not the numbers. 1,600, 2,200 nuclear missiles, it doesn't really make that much of a difference in terms of the numbers. What makes the difference is are we maintaining what we have, however many we have? We aren't. They are. Really? Absolutely. You mean we're not servicing these old warheads? We, we do not research. We haven't conducted a test to make sure that they still function. I think in nine years. And didn't we have a security problem with uh, one of them being flown out uh, on a B-52 discovered later? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, we've we've had you add to this tale of woe. We've had several security <laughs> problems there, John. That's yeah. right. Uh, uh, but I think that there's an advantage to us in that uh, we too can save some money on these uh, systems. That I mean, we've always had more nukes than we needed, and uh, the, the real threat posed by Russia to Western Europe is not what it used to be, to say the least. All this posturing that Russia's doing with Venezuela and uh, you know, kind of kind of doing their replay of the Cuban Missile Crisis without the nuclear warheads is largely designed to try to increase their, their leverage with us. It was interesting to me that Obama wasn't greeted in the streets with big crowds in Moscow like he was in Paris or London or Berlin because Russians see him, hey, one more president, American president coming over here to fleece us. Okay. You know, what, what, what's in this deal for us? That's what they're thinking about. Quite and that's what's important because we need Russia to help us with Iran. Do you right think now. that they're a Latin American presence mm -hmm. but was described in that brilliant setup? Mm -hmm. Do you this think... brilliant indeed, John. Do you think that that's motivated only by uh, playing tit for tat with the United States? Mm -hmm. Or are the Russians concerned, as we are, with the growing Chinese presence, presence in our in our hemisphere? I, I they play it both ways, as they always have. They're very concerned about uh, China. At the same time, they're concerned about us getting too big for our britches. And they don't want those missiles in Poland Is there and, any and, and the Czech Republic. The so, they, so they say, oh, okay, let, let's put some missiles in the Caribbean, see how you like it. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, just like, like this, the 60s this again. This game can be moved a little further. Is there any concern by Russia of China's uh, presence in, maybe that's an overstatement, it's desires on Siberia where there is oil. Yep. Well, it's oh, a yeah. race. It's a race. It's a race. <laughs> and they yes. therefore want to restrain China. Race. Russia it's is losing. It's, it's a race for resources, and it's mm. about oil. And I, I think it's, it's fascinating that the American government is standing up in opposition to the coup in Honduras even though the displaced president is a buddy of uh, the Venezuelan right. president. Because, and, and, and we're on, we're on mm -hmm. Chavez's side. Right. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. but, but it, it, it takes away Chavez's argument that we're somehow over there with the CIA doing things that we've done in the past. So I think it's smart diplomatically. John, to your point, you are exactly right. Russia is losing population at the rate of 750,000 to a million people a year. You take the Russians east of the Ural Mountains all the way over to the Pacific, there's a few million of them out there. That's the last great storehouse of oil, timber, gas, gold, all the things you can think of. The Chinese are moving in there, crossing the border as immigrants, moving into that area. That is what going to be one of the great collisions. And the fact that Russia is fooling around in Latin America where it's got no interest is tit for tat. You want to pick up any of this, Mark? It's, it's not China, though obviously Russia has to be concerned about China. It is simply because superpowers always play in each other's backyards <laughs> and that is what this is about. <laughs> right. well, well, the wheel of crisis as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> high noon for Iran. The other big international news this week, time is ticking for Iran. G8 leader gave Iran until September to quote unquote compromise on its nuclear program or face greater sanctions. We're not going to just uh, wait indefinitely. Uh, and allow for uh, the 
development of a nuclear weapon. So uh, my hope is is that uh, uh, the Iranian leadership will will look at uh, the statement coming out of the G8 and recognize that uh, world opinion uh, is uh, is clear. Question: Was President Obama's stern warning to Iran made possible because of Amani Najad's disputed election win and the ensuing Iran state brutality, Eleanor Cliff? Well, the European allies were actually more outspoken in condemning uh, the uh, Iranian government, and so I think it was easy for President Obama to get what you call the stern warning from a consensus of these nations, but they stopped short of calling uh, for sanctions, and so I think he's mm -hmm. still leaving the door open, as he put it, if Iran wants to walk through the door and engage, the, uh, the outstretched hand is still there on you the part of the Americans. You, they're not going to be able to get UN sanctions. I don't think the Russians or Chinese no. are going to go along. There is legislation, as you know, John, in the Congress of the United States, very, very tough stuff, which would cut off gasoline or punish companies that sold gasoline to Iran. Forty percent of their gasoline is imported. My guess is they're going to push in that direction. I don't know why Obama's doing this because I don't see how the Iranians can say by September we're going to get uh, we're going to get going. I think that's yeah. a deadline and a mistake. Uh, okay, yeah. President Obama, what do you think about Vladimir Putin? I think this is a very smart, very tough, very unsentimental person. Vladimir Putin is unsentimental. There's news there, huh? Unfortunately, well, do you think reading, that was right? appropriate balance of diplomacy with accuracy? I think it was, unfortunately, an indication of the fact that in some critical areas, President Obama does not have the kind of experience and ability to take the kind of position that is needed well, now, to George put somebody w. like Putin on the spot. George W. Bush looked into Putin's eyes and he said that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he he his soul. Yes. yes, indeed. Uh, okay, President Obama, yeah. what do you think about Dmitry Medvedev? I found him to be straightforward, professional. He is clear about uh, the interests of the Russian people, uh, but he's also interested in finding out uh, what the interests of the United States are. A uh, question to you, Clarence. Do you think that's a good balance between diplomacy and precision on the president's part and his description of the Medvedev? For the time being, I think Obama is kind of holding his position uh, right now in regard to these Russian leaders. I thought it was interesting that his, his outreach to, uh, to a Gorby, uh, our, our, our earlier president, to kind of left Gorbachev. You mean uh, sort of, uh, Yeah, sort of. Sort of uh, uh, isolated out there, you know, mm -hmm. but um, uh, here yeah. Obama's bringing him back in. He made well, a mistake, John, when he said uh, uh, Putin's got one foot in the Cold War. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> it may be true, mm -hmm. but you don't that's say right, something like that. He did say that. Good I point. I don't, know, I don't know if that's a mistake. I mean, I think he but did everything he could. You don't say that could. about a foreign he, leader. He did, well, sense. he did everything he could to build up uh, Medvedev, and I think he acknowledges there were two powers because he did meet with Putin right. uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So he's dealing with two people. He clearly would prefer to deal with uh, Medvedev, who doesn't come directly out of the KGB. Exit <laughs> question on a reset scale, zero to ten. Zero meaning zero reset, computer frozen solid, and ten meaning total reset, hard drive clean. Rate how much Obama changed the U.S. relationship with Russia. Three. Three? Yeah. I don't think it's, uh, it's, uh, I don't think it's very extensive. I put it between five and six. I mean, I think because he does want to end the old Cold War and doesn't want to start a new Cold War, but it's still pretty chilly over there. It was there. pretty skillful, though, wasn't it? I thought it was, yes. Uh, Mark? Five, but it's headed to four and probably worse. Clarence? I'm more in that four to five uh, bracket as well. I don't, I don't think it moved it that, that much, but, uh, you know, he showed that, uh, that we are cons consistent in this country, even if yeah. our leaders change. The correct <laughs> answer is five. Uh, you two closest to me are correct. Uh, <laughs> it was a <laughs> reboot, but it was not a reset. Issue two. Sarah's way. I planned each chartered course, each careful step along the byway. More, much more than this, I did it my way. With this announcement, that I'm not seeking re-election. I've determined it's best to transfer the authority of governor to Lieutenant Governor Parnell. Two seminal decisions last week from Sarah Palin, Alaska governor. 
One, he will not seek re-election for 2010. Two, he will resign as governor effective in two weeks, the 26th. Three days after her announcement, the governor was asked whether the 26th of July would in fact turn out to be the end of her political career. Palin was philosophical, even fatalistic. You know, politically speaking, if I die, I die. I, so be it. Question, was Sarah Palin hounded from office by the Democrats? Was she driven out? Did she do the only thing that was feasible? I ask you, Pat. Uh, yeah, I think basically she did do the only thing that was feasible. I don't think she handled it well. Her problem is this. She's 500000 in debt answering Why? these silly... Why? ethics charges which the Democrats keep how throwing many, at them. How many suits were brought against There are 16 or 17 charges they've thrown out, I think, Pat, about I all but one of them. I believe there are 30 suits that were brought against her, and over two, only two have any validity. Well, lot of, validity. none of them have any validity, but frankly, it, she's got five kids. One of the kids is Down syndrome. She's got to help raise her grandchild How there. much money has she spent on lawyers? Personal things is $500,000, and what she did, and, by, and they're hassling her in the legislation, what she's saying is, Look, this lieutenant governor gets a leg up to her nomination and election. Who he can, can do the job. What her total assets are, her net worth. It's going to be a lot more than it is yeah, now that she's right. earning a seven million dollar <laughs> book. Boy, deal. you can't. Don't you see cry how she for can Sarah. Flip it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> she isn't flipping it. Yeah, she's uh, got, no. They're very she's mean to Sarah. She has one point two million in net worth, and that includes the husband's business holding. Does right. that include that's her defense? That's does that include her defense fund? She's got five, she's seven hundred thousand yeah, dollars left. She's about it's, to cash in on the lecture circuit, presumably. Did she have any other feasible uh, alternative she except may, to, except to? Sure, she could have finished the job that she was elected to. Job, which is being kept uh, hounded by suits from your party. Uh, to, I, I think the Republicans are not her friends in Alaska either. Well, they're not know. bringing suits <laughs> against her if and, they're not. And look, um, you know, she made the right decision for her pocketbook. I don't know that she mm. made the right decision for her political future, but she will be a sidekick for right-wing conservative candidates, but she will not be invited to campaign <laughs> for the Republican <laughs> who wants to be governor of Virginia or the well, governor of New Jersey. For what she is what radioactive is, in, in I won't parts describe of the Republican that. Party. I won't describe it as vehemence, <laughs> but that there is vehemence against this John, woman. Can you describe I'm why it exists? Analysis. That was civil. That was civil, that was civil <laughs> compared exactly. to what Sarah I know. Well, I mean, it was passionate <laughs> enough. Why are they so worked up about Here's this woman? Here's why. Here's why. You said her net assets are $1.2 million. You missed the biggest and most important net asset, she connects with America, common sense conservative America, like nobody has since Ronald Reagan. And that terrifies is she blue <laughs> She is blue She is Did common she go to sense a state conservative. University? Yes. Idaho state. But we so have what? a big cultural difference between the aristocratic mm -hmm. That's it. Group within the Democratic the, the Party. The, uh, hey. the illiterati cannot stand hey. her. The elite, the elite. She, is, hey, middle, she is middle I'm American. Oh, yeah. Pat. She, Pat. Is, she is middle American. She is attractive. She's a woman. She's pro-life. She's, uh, she's, she's a pace car babe. Rodeo queen, John. That's she's also not alone in those demographics. You know, I come <laughs> right. from, she went John, I, I want to speak up for middle America that went to state schools. Right. And I come from John Boehner's district, the original Middletown, Ohio. And I want to tell you, I've got so many Republican f women friends back there who, after the Katie Couric interview, called me to say, where's our Barack Obama headquarters? It was incredible. There, there, there was this flip. And I'm hearing the biggest criticism of her coming from Republicans. I mean, Democrats enjoy her. Uh, I uh, hear them talking about how the they hope she does the run again. at the end of the campaign, mm -hmm. she's the only one who's getting out 10,000, 15,000 oh, yeah. people. Okay. And that's out fine. McCain. That's fine. I mean, she's okay. like Newt Gingrich. She's a great fundraiser. Newt and, can't and, get and crowds like that. Sure. More, let's, more, let's, nobody gets crowds like that. Press I, I think that Newt would have a better chance of getting to the primaries than she would, and you don't see him running. Let's see if we can rattle your cage a little more. Don't underestimate Palin. In the August issue of Runner's World, Palin describes her 35-year passion for outdoor running. The 4,100-word interview reveals a lot more about Sarah Palin than just her athleticism. If she goes for a day or a week without running, what does she learn about herself? I feel so crappy if I go more than a few days without running. I have to run. No matter how rotten I feel before or during a run, it's always worth it to me afterwards. Sweat is my sanity. What has running taught her about politics? Same thing it's taught me about life. You have to have determination and set goals, and you don't complain when something's hurting because no one wants to hear it. You get bummed and burned out sometimes in running and in politics, but if you're in for the long haul, 
and you're in it because you know that it is a good thing, then you get out there and you do it anyway. Could the governor beat President Obama in a race? What I lack in physical strength, I make up for in determination and endurance. So if it were a long race that required a lot of endurance, I'd win. Question, what accounts for Palin's running addiction, Mark? Can you speak to that? That is the perfect analogy for Sarah Palin. She is in it for the long run. Her muffed resignation situation is simply a pulled hamstring from which she will recover. <laughs> you know, her I mother like and father see. were runners, too. Yes, her indeed. father ran in the yeah. marathon. I like to and they it. don't like to lose either. Middle-class America yeah. understands John, yeah. sweat. John, I'd like, like to see her and Obama DNA go one-on-one. I'd on one. yep. like to see her and Obama John, go one-on-one. One. competitiveness, John, real and you authentic, know, not uh, synthetic like so many politicians in Washington. You know, this interview is quite fascinating. You fascinating. know, she doesn't want to run with anybody because she doesn't want to talk. She I, wants a solitary I, I moment. Oh, she wants to talk to people I, she wants to talk to. Oh. She picks her interviewers very carefully. As somebody, as somebody, as somebody, as somebody, as somebody yeah. who has been running for probably longer than Sarah Palin, who feels crappy if she doesn't run for more than probably two days, I identify with everything she said, but it doesn't comport with the way she walked away from her job as governor. You can decide not to wow. run again, but quitting is not a good platform no. do do to 30, run for what president. Do do with, what do you do but with if she 30 lawsuits that have come from Democrats? It's not that many lawsuits. That have blood, first of all, she's all she's not, she's excuse me, they're, they're not going to go away, first of all. And second of all, if she ever does become president, I hope no. she does walk away and quit. <laughs> but issue three, embrace the legacy, overlook the lunacy. The song is We Are The World, and it may very well be the crown jewel not only of Michael Jackson's entertainment legacy, but also, get this, his political legacy. We Are The World, Jackson's universalist worldview. If you will, similar to that of Thomas Jefferson. A belief in the inalienable connection of all people. Everybody understands. Harry Belafonte explains to Larry Africa. King how Africa became the focus of Michael how Jackson's artistry Michael and the reach of his one world outlook. Well, for a long time I had been watching the continent of Africa uh, uh, wither under the devastation of the famine and the drought. And literally hundreds of thousands of people were dying. I turned to artists and said, we have a job here to do. And when Michael decided to step to the table, he brought the greatest gift of all. He and Lionel Richie wrote the song. By the way, Michael Jackson's total contributions by my staff's edition is about $300 million, page after page of people, and his own foundation. Mm -hmm. Pretty impressive. Yep. Uh, in 1985, We Are the World reached number one on the music charts in 20 countries. It raised $50 million for the African relief effort. In today's currency, we Are the World would have yielded $100 million in aid for Africa. Question, was Jackson a trendsetter in using his music for humanitarian relief efforts? I ask you, Mark. The federal government spends $100 million before lunch. <laughs> it, unfortunately, it's like a snowflake. It's here, and then it's gone. Are you but saying more trend, about though. the solution of what should be done? Because there are those who think that the aid for Africa is excessive and it has the law of diminishing returns is set in and there should be a different policy towards Africa. There absolutely should be a different policy in Africa. African governments are the reason Africa needs help. Pat. Yeah, uh, I think, well, I do say this, Michael Jackson and Bono and all these other people in Hollywood, I think they are doing good works. Maybe they're doing it to be, get publicity. But when they take all this money they earn and they give it for good causes, whether it's abroad or at home, I say you give the guys credit. Okay, yeah. another well-known American speaks about Africa, less inspired by the African continent, more saddened by it. President Obama this week visited the nation of Ghana with its 24 million citizens, the same population of Texas, but about half the size of Texas. Ghana on the west coast of Africa, the Atlantic Ocean, and about halfway up with an annual GDP per capita of $1,500 that's per year, about 200th in rank out of 230 nations. Religion almost 70% Christian, 16% Muslim. This is President Obama's fourth visit to the African continent and his second as president, the first being the June trip to Cairo. He visited Africa this week to encourage 
democratic governance and food independence. When Obama talks about Africa, he becomes melancholy and worse. Quote, I remember the first time I took Michelle to Kenya shortly before we were married. Michelle was bursting with excitement about the idea of visiting the continent of her ancestors. And we had a wonderful time. But during our travels, Michelle also heard, as I had heard during my first trip to Africa, the terrible sense on the part of most Kenyans that their fates were not their own. On the flight back to Chicago, Michelle admitted she was looking forward to getting home. There are times when considering the plight of Africa, the millions wrecked by AIDS, the constant droughts and famines, the dictatorship, the pervasive corruption, the brutality of 12-year-old guerrillas who know nothing but war, wielding machetes or AK-47s, I find myself plunged into cynicism and despair. Do you want to speak to that, Clarence? Well, yeah, I, I know that feeling that, that Michelle had when I uh, first w went over to Africa and back in the 70s. I, I felt uh, very similarly. I think African Americans tend to have kind of a fantasy view of Africa, sort of a Disneyfied or Alex Haley view. Uh, when you've been over there for a while, you uh, first, first you, you have this, this you're struck by the realities that Obama was talking about, the, these negative aspects. The longer you're there, the more you realize every country is different. Leadership is the problem, it's not productivity. Uh, and when Obama talks about food independence right now, now, he's not talking about the same kind of thing that Michael Jackson and Bono and all were doing. He's talking about independence. In other words, don't give them a fish, teach them to fish. Uh, because uh, outside aid can actually compete mm -hmm. with uh, development mm -hmm. of their own markets and their right. own agriculture and all. So you want to try to help them to be in independent. Is Palin washed up, yes or no, Pat? Nonsense. Chief Republican surrogate in 2010. Eleanor. Yeah, I agree with that. Nobody's ever washed up in political America. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Liberals get used to it. She's around for the long run. Clarence. Great future in TV talk. She's an experienced interviewer. Not politics. No, nah, nah, she'll, she'll never get past the primaries. No, wait till the uh, financial crisis kicks in and affects the middle class. She's going to have a future. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Bye-bye.